talks to you. So today we get to talk about Ephesians again. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to be focusing on prayer for deeper experience of God's fullness. Um, we're going to be focusing on Ephesians chapter 3, starting verse 14 through 21. And the header for that specific section of scripture is prayer for the Ephesians. So this is a prayer, it is structured as a prayer. Um, getting into it, I'll go ahead and start us off and read it. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, for whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Pray out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray to you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be f filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to immeasurably more, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is working within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So, a couple notes. Chapter 3 starts very blatantly. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. So he really wants us to focus that Paul's writing this in prison for the betterment of the Gentiles. <laughs> in some of the notes Pastor gave me, he wanted to drive home that Paul felt that it was his duty to sort of bow his knee and pray for those entrusted in his care. Um, we can't really do anything in certain situations. And Paul felt that he was in that certain situation where he felt helpless. So for that reason, we can bend our knees like Paul is and pray for strength through the Holy Spirit. So, anything stand out to you in the first couple verses is significant? We talk about bowing your knee or kneeling, and all my life, I would have been one that was years ago in a church where you had to kneel. Yes. You had to kneel right yep. now to take communion or to say prayer. Mm -hmm. And that one that they loosen them up. Yep. Um, but otherwise, at my home and that stuff, I have never gotten involved with kneeling. Um, and Reading this, and also there was a in the devotional, not a couple two maybe days ago or a week ago or so, it was implying sort of the same thing right. get on your knees or something like mm -hmm. that, and uh, uh, you know, to show your, but I mean, I'm not showing anybody in my house because I'm not there, no right. there. but that it popped both in this today, in this thing, and the one that promotion had a, uh, I have a knelt to say about my prayers, God, or other things. I mean, is that, does it really make you feel better, maybe? Kneeling, so. Let's pick this up. I think it all depends on so, you and your prayer, maybe. I know I used to get down and <laughs> kneel, not so much anymore, <laughs> uh, but. Um, there have been times and things that have happened in my life that I feel that I've been knocked down to my knees and I thought her down and prayed. And I just would say, you know, this, but other, you know, now I don't get down on my knees quite so much. Do they in other churches or 
is that there's still a practice of kneeling down in church for you know like in other churches or or do none of them do it anymore? I know like you know, it depends on the mean? church. There's they do. I've been to a few where they still have kneelers built into the back of the chairs or pews. Oh, for, take Many kind of people take communion. Most uh, most of what I've experienced now is it's on your own. Into, yeah. Yeah. It's if you feel comfortable doing it, more to you. You don't have to. Um, but looking back into chapter three, verse one. For the reason I, Paul, the pri prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. He's, later on, he's, he's already established that he's a prisoner to Christ. And if you're a prisoner, there's someone with authority over you. And that person over you, regardless of your beliefs, deserves a certain level of respect. And he's in a really um, humbling position where he's in prison and even verse 14 for the reason I kneel before the father continues on verse 15 from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name He's acknowledging, in his kneeling, he's acknowledging the weight that God carries, the power God has. So it's a, kneeling is a sign of humility and respect. Um, and personally, I think it's kind of a lost in today's society. Um, nowadays, kneeling can often mean disrespect. Think about the uh, Colin Kaepernick and stuff. A lot of people see it as disrespect. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Spiritually, I don't know what kind of weight it holds, but I do think there is something to be said about putting yourself in a physical position to sort of help your, I don't know, maybe this is just me talking, but kneeling kind of puts me in a, um, more of a mindset to, I don't know, maybe be more honest, maybe feel a little bit more connected. I don't, that's just me personally. And I don't kneel all that often. Um, kneeling. You can see where kneeling can have two different effects. Yes. You stuff to think about when you mentioned Colin Kaepernick taking a knee and kneeling, and then you look at Tim Tebow kneeling. So you see uh, two different aspects of mm -hmm. kneeling. And it's all opinion based, too. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if there's a right answer, but I know. Your heart right. And I know Paul's doing it out of humility and I don't I don't necessarily think he felt he had a choice but to kneel before God. And I don't think any one of us would be able if we met him today would be able to truly stand before God. I think all of us would fall to our knees. Um So some of the notes is maybe not so much kneeling, but bowing before we come to God with reverence, like we bow before we enter uh, the table of communion. That's a sign of humility and sort of tipping the hat, sign of respect, which is respect in general has been lost in society lately. So. It's more of a focus of, 
I'm kneeling because what's on my heart. Not because I, I don't know, trying to make sense and not ramble. Um, the point being, if you feel something in your heart that is strong enough to kneel, then it should reflect, your physical stance should reflect your inner feelings, if that makes sense. Verse 15, notice there are two groups mentioned here. A whole family in heaven, saints gone before, and on earth, saints doing the work of grace. And to emphasize family, also translated as fatherhood, Greek word uh, translated as patria, I did don't don't yell at me if I butcher that. <laughs> Can also be um, translated as ancestry. So family isn't just our immediate nuclear family. So some people render every family or every fatherhood as interpretation. And in this they have a concurrence of who, many who agree. How would or does the wording change the meaning? Does it to change the meaning to you? I wasn't quite sure what that sentence was. But I didn't so, that. You know, I looked at that and I thought, referencing well, back at the family, maybe doesn't have a father, but then every fatherhood means there is one. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure we don't want this question, but I don't no, know. I, I, what was that question that Pastor like, must have spelled so, wrong? What, what is this question? I believe he's asking, so in verse 15, from whom his whole family who is the family? Like, I think he's trying to get us to dig a little deeper than just surface and define who that family is. Whether it's our personal family or our church family? It's a church, I think. He's talking about the church. It would be the church. The church. church. He's, he's talking about the church. This is a prayer for the Ephesian church as they're going through difficulties. Paul's kind of upset with them. And they're trying to make church both Jews and Gentiles, right? If you want. And they're trying to make they should be still of the same. Right. Same so it doesn't matter which you are, if you, well, as long as you are true to the Christian beliefs, I think is what he's getting at. Both make up one family. Which, regardless of which definition you mean, you use, whether every family or every fatherhood, it's still a family. Just what is a fatherhood? A family. One household, and they're called Christians. That's what he's trying to get home in a very roundabout way. Well, I'm going to have to ask Pastor what he means because it's like, an interesting question of interpretation arises here. Well, what the, how or what was the question about the interpretation? I didn't even understand what he was trying to 
the word family where it's translated as fatherhood in means or something yeah. translated so in my history. in my um Bible, I've got a study by a Concordia study Bible. And it shows me that there's a little a, a little letter marking that there's a, another translation for it that can be used. And it says 15 or whom all fatherhood. So he's asking which one, like what was the difference? And it honestly there isn't it, because it's both one family both one household, and they're all Christians. So in some Bibles where mine says from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name, do some Bibles translate that then as from fatherhood yeah, oh, well, mine probably does too here, yeah. Yeah, mine does too, but it's like, well, huh? But I think the focus is that he really wants to drive home that the family that we're talking about here isn't just your nuclear family, isn't just your ancestry, it's your Christian family. It's the church family. Well, I, I, I thought from reading that, I thought he meant the church from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Well, well what is the, the church? Other than the church. What is the church? Well, the church is the people, believers. the believers. Called yeah. Christians. Yes. That are grouped as a often compared to a family. Well, the one thing to remind me is those who isolate, <laughs> they're talking about the members of the church, like those who isolate themselves from that family and try to do it alone, cut themselves off from that power. Right. So. And you know, that would be. I can't see where there's like a big controversy in any of that. I don't either, but. Okay. <laughs> But maybe for some, there is. What? I personally don't see it either. Okay. okay. <laughs> Moving on. Verse 16. All right, yes. Talking about riches. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that it I will run too far. Got carried away. So, where am I? Okay, talking about his riches mm -hmm. and glory. There's like a story. Now, tell me if you've heard this story about when you go to heaven, there's probably some person went to heaven and he saw these boxes on the floor that had been opened. But then he saw all these boxes on the shelf that hadn't been opened. And he says to the Lord, what are all those boxes? And he said, those are all the blessings I had for you that you never asked for. I haven't heard that. So when I look at the riches of his glory, I always think maybe we always think too small. I would agree with that. Or maybe we're too scared. Or don't know how to ask. And that we're not in the right position or mindset or milestone in our faith walk to ask for them. And who's to even say that? There's a lot that our human brain can't wrap our head around when it comes to God. 
the fact that he has a predetermined, like a couple weeks ago when we talked about um, good deeds and that we, he has predetermined good deeds for us to carry out. How do we even comprehend that? That he has predetermined points in our time that we are going to do something good. And he knows we're going to do something good because we are Christians. I don't necessarily, I understand the concept, but I don't necessarily agree to it. Like, I think it's more of a symbolization that um, what God wants for us is so much more than we could possibly imagine. And what he wants to give us is so much more than we could possibly imagine. That when we see the boxes, it's overwhelming how many, in comparison, how many we actually were blessed with compared to what he truly wants to give. And that continues to come into play as we're talking about his fullness and his love. So we're, the whole point of this prayer is to talk about lost my place, hold on. Talk about um, where is power and love. It's to show God's key gifts are power and love. Not necessarily societal power or physical power. Certainly could be that, but I think the real power is spiritual power. Being so full in God and Christ that we are just immensely powerful in thought, deed, etc. Does that make sense? Okay. So going back to verse 16. Paul uses this kind of riches of his glory line at least four times in his writings. Again, in Romans 9, 23, Ephesians 16, which we just read, Philippians 4, 19, and Colossians 1, 27. Strengthen you with power through the Spirit. Why is the reminder here? If we look back to previous chapters, chapter one, verse, where is it? 13. You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth and gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So Paul, in the middle of writing a prayer for power and in chapter one. Oh, um, um, in chapter one, it refers to being sealed with the promise of the spirit. And then in chapter three, I mean, isn't that kind of where the power comes from? It's through the Holy Spirit, and right? Did you get that through baptism? Probably refers to the Ephesians of the 
probably refers to the majority of the Ephesians who were Gentiles, marked with a seal in those days, sealed, denoted ownership. So they were claimed by God in the eyes of the um, Gentiles that because it probably refers to the majority of the Ephesians who were Gentiles. So when God opened up salvation to not just the Jews, but the Gentiles, not all Gentiles are believers. But those who are believers are sealed and claimed, right? That's where this reminder comes into play that, hey guys, you are sealed in Christ. He owns you. Just like in the very first verse of the chapter, he goes, for the reason, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, he owns you in every single way. And I think that Paul's trying to drive home, don't forget what you are. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget who claimed you. Where am I? Okay. <laughs> 17 and 18. <laughs> so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. So that builds on to the reminder in the previous verse that, hey, you guys are claimed. You are claimed by God, just like I am a prisoner to God. Get what I'm saying? Like, it's a wake up call. Like, you guys are kind of slacking off. Wake up, smack on the back of the head. What are you doing? So, through faith may dwell. Sorry, I butchered that. Um, Pastor, here's where I have a problem. So I should okay. probably talk to Pastor. Because I think he says, because you mentioned baptism, is when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Which I'm thinking that's not right. First of all, in the creed we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, First. the Lord and giver of life. So I still say that spirit is what gives you life. Now, it takes the spirit to work in you, to open your heart and your mind to that word and to the message of Christ. But I think you have that spirit and every person is born with that spirit when they are born. The Lord and giver of life. What does that mean when we say that every Sunday? Stop and think. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. Yes, not when we're baptized. So even here, he's saying with the power through his spirit in your inner being, you have that in you. He doesn't say after you've been baptized, nothing. That spirit is in you. I don't disagree. And that spirit will then 
work in you I, to open your heart and mind okay. to the message. What was this question? Why did Jesus get baptized then? Jesus was baptized, I think probably just to, we discussed this before, but I think really to fulfill the law. Yes. And not only to fulfill the law, to seal this that very he is. Among the Jews, see? Right. Now we're talking about Gentiles. The Gentiles really didn't have to become no. baptized. The Jews did because that was a cleansing that they back from uh, Leviticus to make themselves clean. The women had to go and, you know, purify themselves. And if anything happened, the men had to go and uh, make themselves clean. This was a very much a ritual in the Jewish uh, community. Ooh, how do you mean? What, what the, these traditions that they have? That yes. Would, would yeah, they, they haven't changed they have. because they don't. They only read the Torah, which is the first half of the Bible, the New, the um, Old Testament, and they don't believe that the Messiah has come because they don't believe in Jesus Christ. Now there are. I always butcher their name. There is a sect of Judaism that does believe. I can't ever remember their name. No, it's it's not Messianic. It's um, I can't think of it right now. But there is a sect of them that do believe, and therefore they will be in heaven with us. But currently, since the point is, he wants us to see that there's a triune God that's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the root of it all. That I agree with you. The Holy Spirit is in you at birth. I don't disagree with that. That's my personal belief. If Pastor wants to fight me on it, fight me on it. Right. Right. And that's putting, that's a formal seal upon someone. That's not a light thing. I mean, it's a sacrament. So. John the Baptist. Mm hmm. Well, it would have done that in the Old Testament, like I said, to purify themselves. They didn't maybe say the word baptism, but still it was a washing of the water, which is right. what baptism is. But that's just me. I sort of have my own religion. <laughs> <laughs> but does that make sense that in this... Hold on, I'm getting confused in this place. So, does that make sense on why Paul said what he said? Up to 18, you mean? Yeah, 17 and 18. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long, high and deep, is the love of Christ. I wrote down, when I was studying for this, I wrote down um, a reference verse for that specific verse, since the study Bible gives me a bunch of references to help paint a broader picture than just a snippet. So Romans 7, verse 22, for in my inner being, I will be delighted in God's law. Okay, 
from your this mindset in Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. About that. I I oh, wait, hold on. I might be. No, I'm right. Or uh, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who lived me and gave himself for me. So, in this, we see the most intimate and happy communion between Christ and Christians. We see him being 100 and everything and more that we could possibly rationalize for us. He says it in his notes, he put, it began at our baptism, but it needs to daily, it needs daily growth and strengthening. For it is through faith that Christ dwells in our heart. How sad it is that there is a loss of faith. The loss of faith is the forgiveness of, the loss in faith, the loss of faith and forgiveness of sins means the loss of Christ himself. So, Paul's Going back to Ephesians, in this prayer, Paul's really, really, really begging that and pleading and heart-wrenchingly open, no holding back, asking that we all understand how deep and wide, high and low, his love is for us. Can't really know because he even acknowledges and thus surpasses knowledge. Right. So I hope that they're only in heaven will this prayer be fully answered. We won't know until we put it up. The desire of him writing this prayer is for us to look back and help us understand that. This love never, never ends. Try to fully grasp this love, which surpasses knowledge. Why even try to grasp it? If it right there says surpasses knowledge, why even, why even try, why get hung up on trying to understand the nuances of it? loves us so much. You know, I mean, that's, that's why we worship him. Mm-hmm. It, look back a little again. Verse 18. May have power together with the saints and grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. He prays that we are able to grasp and comprehend. Yes. Yeah, very much so. In how can God love us when even looking at someone else in their troubles, how can they look like a lot of people judge killers, but if that killer comes to Christ before he dies, he is and will be saved. And a lot of people have a hard time coping that, with that. 
And that's what this prayer is trying to help with. It's trying to remind us and um, better understand that his love is really never ending, which is really tough. Especially when you're sitting at home and you're either playing on the computer or you're watching right. the TV and then you think I should be reading the Bible or reading the prayer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and often. And you're playing this game where I'm watching the same thing. Right. right. And I think, instead of studying the Bible, Bible or reading it, instead of reading it. People could. We do devotions every day, right. but if we do them for how long? Right. 10, 15 minutes or something like that, you know? Well, like, so in this prayer, like Paul is not only saying that he hopes that we understand it, but he hopes that it never goes away. Well, how would it go away? God's not going to turn his back on us. We're going to turn our back on him. He's praying that we stay in the faith and that we don't get discouraged in our lack of understanding, but rather study and strive to make sense of it or maybe just be okay with not fully understanding it. There's a lot of stuff that I don't understand and I'm okay with it because I never will. You noted that only in heaven will this prayer fully be answered. That's true. Once we are with him, we will completely understand. We won't have any lack of understanding. Moving on to verse 19. And to know that, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be fulfilled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Anything to add to that? Any questions, comments, concerns? Heaven, you know, the, our new body coming into that one, we're filled with the fullness of God. Completely and utterly, yes. But we can be praying that we stay close to Him, that we don't veer off, and that we grow in our faith. And we're not just maintaining a you know, my mom always ripped on me in school because I was very much the guy that could be all A's if I put this much of effort into it. <laughs> but there were so much other things that I wanted to do that I'm like, eh, C's are okay. Yeah. You know, C's get degrees, but, you know, like, you shouldn't be looking at it like that with your faith. You should be cherishing your faith that you won't settle for anything less than 100%. But the reality of it is that we will never be 100% until we are in heaven and made whole again through him. So I have a, another reference verse that says the same thing in a little different way. Colossians 2 verse 10. And you have been given the fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. Think about that for a minute. We got the top dog of the top dog of the top dog of the top dog, king of kings, beginning and end. We've got all his power, all his authority 
on our side because we believe in him and we have a love for him and we have a relationship with him. How sad would it be to be against that? And that's the per- that furthers the point that Paul's trying, really, really, really trying to drive home that do not lose your faith. We also say that every Sunday. For thine is the kingdom and the power. And a lot of people overlook it. A lot of people, it's just a kind of mantra that's said every day on Sunday. Never again. It becomes a routine and not a belief. And that's when I, I think of things like that, like things that we take for granted, I think that's what Paul's trying to be like, hey, guys, wake up. You shouldn't be taking that for granted. You shouldn't be just saying it to say it or saying it because you feel the need to say it. Maybe they just, maybe they were just pretty much like we are, that they don't really understand how high and low and wide and deep I agree. So it's like, okay, you know, I, you keep reminding us. Right. And it's important because we are, I don't know about you, but I'm forgetful. Pretty for, even at a young age, I'm pretty forgetful. Like, there's been some times where, so, like, I just had a rough season in life and it was pretty well. And I forgot a lot. And I've since been reminded and I've made a bounce back. I've been in a pretty good season past stretch. I'm pretty happy. Well, my age is being very forgetful, but I don't think I'm going to come back. The game is just coming. Take from you. And I've noticed, um, I do, have you been raised on the Janelle's bracelets? The Christian altar gift to the and she, well, we did it one. I did it one time when she was here. Oh, she had it in church. And I love the the Lord's Prayer one. Like it, it makes you. You don't just ramble off the prayer. It's like every sentence, every like phrase, has emotion, and it forces you to kind of think about what you're saying instead of just rambling it off. You know. Right, or even like saying it in the older style that came. To- like with thy and the instead of common word and can help make you stop and think about what you're saying for a little bit longer. Maybe have a more, not, I want to say impactful because I believe there is power in the Lord's prayer, no matter how you say it. But I don't think that if you, I think if you take the time to emphasize it, it will do more for you in the long run, for your individual faith. If you don't lose sight of its value and worth. There have been times when I've taken things that like the Lord's Prayer, even or the Queen's or something like that, instead of saying like the or you know, mm-hmm. say, me. Yeah, that's not in the phrase moves too. Sometimes yeah. we do, oftentimes it's like one sided, mm-hmm. you know, face or asymmetrical, you know, like this arm is out here and then you do it again <laughs> and you go on this side. And like we'll say, we'll run through whatever verse we're studying and you'll say it like it's written, but then the second time through, she'll. Speak it as like an affirmation in first person. Well, even the Lord's Prayer, they're saying, Our Father, my Father, mm-hmm. who art in heaven. And then we down to the part where you're. It's just yeah, to make me think more what am I saying? Otherwise, it's sort of just repetition. Mm-hmm. Maybe you don't like sometimes in church you say, the creed of the Lord's Prayer, and we have all those people there going. And when you get down to the thing, I really didn't pay attention right. to what my words were. So,
trying to say this in a correct manner that I would not be misspeaking or getting myself into trouble. <laughs> because personally, if you look at the history of our world and the his biblical history, our church was founded on one man. Christ put one man in charge to run the church. And personally, I don't believe that, kind of controversial. Personally, I don't believe that God just wants you to have a religion and, and believe in him. I think he wants you to have a meaningful relationship with him. Something that is yours, something that the person sitting next to you, it's not exact, it's very similar, but it's yours, it's unique to you. I don't, you know what I'm, do you understand what I'm yeah, trying to get across? Right. They're, they all believe in the true, yep. They, exactly. They all believe in the triune God. They all believe Jesus was who he said he was, did what he said he did. And that if you have faith in him, you will be in heaven. That's the basis of it. Church, not church, religion is man-made. And that's a dangerous thing to say. I don't think because I think I've said the same thing. Um, in some eyes, you know, it's a dangerous uh, thing to we say. We went to Kensington for probably, what now, four or five years, maybe. Um, so the and, issue. You know, I loved their message because their message was always Christ centered. Agreed. It was always um, I've been... pertinent mm -hmm. to your life. Mm hmm. If we ever said the Lord's Prayer, it would have been once in a year. I mean, there was no. So, you know, there's, there's none of that. Not the Apostles' Creed. No, nothing like that. It was, this is a message. This is a message from Christ. That's what you went for. You sang, you heard the message from Christ, and that was pretty much it. No, that's, you know, I have so some they, issues you with know, you come here and you have a ritual. You say the Lord's Prayer, you say the Apostles' Creed, and the nice, you know, and it's a, it's a ritual. Okay. I do so like... that's why I say I'm not a Lutheran. That's I'm fine. a Christian. Right, and that's... A Lutheran, Lutheran I is a... I don't believe in some of the Lutheran. Right, and that's okay. And that's okay. And so far, he hasn't struck me with the lightning bolt. <laughs> so far. <laughs> that's okay. I myself have been to Kensington and a few other non-denominational churches before. And the, there's a few things that stick out to me. And personally, I think it, they do a disservice to their members for not having this. Firstly, their sermons often lack law. Law is equally important as gospel. Because if we don't have the law, why do we have the gospel? Well, then again, if Christ fulfilled the law, maybe we could just do away with the law because Christ has already fulfilled it. Hmm. Hmm. Christ what? has fulfilled the law. Yes. He has fulfilled the law. Then Pastor Otten, he always preached on the law. And I'm like, <laughs> forget the law. Okay. All right. Let's get to the gospel, Pastor Otten. So, you know Pastor Otten. I do. I do. So, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, we, we, I, uh, I get it. Ooh. However, remember a conversation a couple weeks back when. You asked me about um, being a sinner, but oh, being yes, saved at the same time. 
That's uh. <laughs> okay, but, let's, let's look at two. Dead to sin, but alive in Christ. So that's me. I am dead to sin, but alive in Christ. Yes. And that's how I live my life. Yes, your soul. I do not want to live with the guilt. That your spiritual. The Catholic Church puts on you. The Lutheran Church puts guilt on you. I understand. The Lois thinking playing her games, and she's thinking, "No, I'm not reading my Bible." Yep. That's a guilt that the church has put on us. No, I'm alive in Christ. Every moment of my life is given to Christ. So if I want to play that game, that's fine because I am still in Christ. That's a lot to unpack, and <laughs> I'm going to do my best. <laughs> so, now, can I talk? <laughs> so, yeah. well, as we discussed before, yes. spiritually, yes. we are dead to sin. Our body our flesh, our physical being is still very alive in sin. Our world is still very, I mean, look around you. Our world is still extremely alive in sin. Yes, we are saved. Yes, we are in Christ. However, a new creation. Agreed. A new creation. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say that because I think we all still have to look at the Ten Commandments or just. But that's the part two, of the law. Maybe the two commandments in Christ, maybe that's. Now stop to think about this. Christ gave us two commandments. So maybe we don't have to look at the Ten because Christ gave us two. Love the Lord, love, the, love your neighbor. Okay. Those are the two commandments. So maybe that, once we love the Lord, we no longer have to like look at those ten commandments. Okay. Not saying so, that we won't, you know, maybe. So for in so, my in my men's group that okay. my dad and I did, um, it was all about foundations. And it was by Ken Ham. And in that series, it talks about our foundation has to be in Christ. It has to be in this. This is Christ. Yes, indeed. This is his plan, his guidebook for us. If this isn't true, or if a section of this isn't true, or I don't believe it to be true, then I don't believe anything of it. If you start chipping away at your own foundation, then you have no foundation at all, was the whole premise of it. So if you don't, I'm not saying that if you don't accept the law, there's repercussions for it, but I'm saying you have to look at it. Like, just think about it. Think about it. And ask Pastor about it for further questions. Because I'm not qualified to give you any more than that. <laughs> so moving on to the last two verses. Let me flip there. Yes. Before we read it, what does the doxology mean? To stand up and we'll sing a verse. <laughs> okay, what does that symbolize? <laughs> Dig deeper. Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. The, the Trinity, right? It's a prayer of praise to God. Well, yes. Well, a, a verse, when we sing a verse, if it a, praises Father, Son, and the Spirit. Right. A liturgical formula for praise to God. It is a literal sentence structure, literary structure to praise Christ. It's a prayer of praise to God. Exactly what it says in my... <laughs> <laughs> so, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine 
according to the power that is at work within us to him be the glory in church and in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations and forever and ever. Amen. Okay. There's no better way to end a doxology than giving praise. It shows us God who is beyond all exceeding abundantly above what we ask, think. Reading the last two verses helps us show the power of God is. The power of God, which is active in us. But to see that God's power can do more than we ever think of asking for. Going back to your story about the boxes. It's all about gotten <laughs> we don't even know how little we know compared to God think about that for a second we don't even we can't even grasp what we don't grasp compared to God Finished. Right there. He's finished. Amen. And then the letter continues. Chapter 4. <laughs> okay. It's sort of like, okay, I'm going to give this all to you right now. Amen. And then he had another thought. And he goes to chapter 4. So, <laughs> I think he was trying to take the time to address things that he saw that needed to be addressed and do it on behalf of others as a fellow Christian. He took the time, recognized someone needed something, took the time out of his own day to sit down, compile a prayer, he write it down. Nothing. He was a prisoner. <laughs> he was sitting there doing nothing. Not, not taking time out of the day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was a that was an emphasis, but no. So no, but seriously, he took the time to write it down and say it for his fellow Christian, which is what we should all be doing for others. He's saying, "Hey, wake up!" But at the same time but he's also asking for their God to help them. He's not just pointing out, hey, you're doing wrong, but he's also asking, hey, God, can you kind of help them? Just like I need the help, just like everybody needs the help. Like we pray in church. Yep. And, pray for God to help others. Right. Paul's prayer is not just said by him. We can also say it to him be the glory in the church, in the Christ Jesus, through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The point being, his glory is proclaimed. The entire church should confess that the praise is not about man, but about God. Alone. If we live this, confess this, then his glory shall be forever and ever. Amen. So the prayer was broken into four petitions. Verse 16, out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. Verse 17, so that, is, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. In verse 18, may the uh, power together with all the saints in verse 19, filled to the measure of the fullness of God. That's every basic prayer. That's the general structure. Good prayer for us. Mm -hmm. and with, we all need strengthen. We all need to have Christ grow more in our hearts. 
Most definitely. We have to understand the power that he has. So. And the fullness of Christ is in us. Not to bring that back up again, but I believe that we personally, I'll be the first one to tell you, I fail daily. Well, Spiritually, at work, at home, as a son, as a brother, whatever it is, I fail daily. There's something that I could have said and didn't. There's something that I did that I shouldn't have. Whatever it is. And I believe that that would be a great prayer. We're all, my, we're all sinners. I know you don't like it. <laughs> we are. <laughs> and with that, that's all I have. I'm gonna close in a prayer and then We'll be good to go. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gathered here today, um, please bless and use what we learned about your immense power and love for us. Um, please guide and strengthen us and remind us on the daily of your power and of your love. Throughout the week, please give us the strength to pursue a deeper understanding of that great power and love. Lord, we are delighted to know you, and we have, we are delighted to know you and accept that power and love. We are extremely delighted to have the blessing of your Holy Spirit and remind and again remind us and guide us in your your will and allow us to set aside our own in your name we pray amen bye Karen okay. Okay.